much, Helen. Um, okay, yeah, welcome to Marketing Matters. This is one of the um, series of Silicon Brighton events where we talk about marketing. We cross over into tech and we also look at new topics to bring in new minds and interests into this universe that we are in, whatever that looks like. And today we're talking about hospitality and tech and collaboration in amongst that. So before you, you have legends, <laughs> legends of the hospitality space. Um, I'm going to hand over to each to introduce introduce themselves and over the course of this panel we're going to take you on a little journey we're going to go start with research and data and understanding the landscape as it is at the moment within the hospitality space for operators we're going to move into how that looks currently for the impact and the impact on operators um, and what kind of actions people have been taking within operator, uh, operating businesses we are going to look at creative innovation in a line with tech, and then we're going to look at the future. So, a short introduction from each of you, please. Jo, can we start with you? Me first, excellent. Hi, I'm Jo Lynch. I'm an account director at CAM Research and Insights. We are a research and insight consultancy, surprisingly, um, only focused on hospitality. We don't do anything else other than hospitality. So it's it's in the blood, it's in the bones, it's, in, it's like the stick of rock. Um, my background is having left school, I actually worked in corporate finance at Barclays Bank for 13 years, but don't hold that against me. Um, and then I left to have children and then decided, didn't want to go back to banking. I met a very lovely lady called Anne Elliott, who Mark knows very well, because that's how Mark and I met originally, who ran a consultancy close to home. It fitted in with me having little children. Um, and I worked for Anne for 11 years. We, it was just me and her to start with, and we grew it to about 20 people. Um, again, only focused on hospitality. She's ex Whitbread and ex many, many things. Sure. Yeah, 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 Pizza Hut, all the whip bread brands. Um, I then went to an operator business. I worked for the big table group, casual dining group as it was then. So we had Bella Italia, Cafe Rouge, Las Iguanas, Belgo, La Tasca for a bit. Um, so I was a head of marketing for big table group, casual dining group. Um, went through the whole furlough thing three and a half years ago, which was horrible. Um, was responsible for implementing tech project projects in the business as well from an operational perspective, not from a technical perspective. Don't ask me to describe what an API is because I will glaze over. Um, but would try, try and would deliver it from the point of view of getting the GMs to buy into tech. So my biggest project was putting a, an entirely new booking system into the, the into 250 sites, which was quite a challenge. Um, I then left to go to a tech business and I went to a company called Yumpingo, which is guest experience. Um, got made redundant. No, I didn't get made redundant. The role got made redundant last October. I've got to get the terminology right. Um, and I then went to work for Cam, who I've known Katie, um, who is uh, the director, the founder, for actually about 10 years. Because actually, when I was at Casual Dining Group, I gave her one of her very first projects um, when she set up Cam. So I was her client. So it's like full circle great fun. Um, we only do hospitality, as I said. We do lots of projects for operators, for suppliers. My, my focus is tech companies, uh, QSR, casual dining, bit of pubs and bars, and can't remember what else, coffee shops, yeah. premium dining, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, it's great fun. We, we love data. You will have to excuse me for having my iPad to hand because I can't retain percentages in my head <laughs> very well, but I am going to speak to you about facts and figures in a bit. Perfect. So Jordan, tell hey. us a bit about you. Um, my CV is not that big, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Jordan Mower. I'm uh, born and bred in Brighton, uh, now the founder head brewer of Unbard. Uh, before Unbard, uh, I was in the water industry, project manager getting water across fields basically. Um, and was brewing out of my shed and got absolutely obsessed, addicted um, of, of creating beer. Um, next year will be 10 years since that shed started. Um, that'd be the big anniversary. Um, I'm sure I'll go more into detail of, of Unbarred um, later on. But yeah, pretty much my, my, my career it has been my passion, fortunately, following uh, food, drink, hospitality, um, and I'll talk a bit about how 
creating products and how we've connected with people uh, through the, the power of beer. <laughs> Cheers. Olivia. Olivia Reid. Um, I'm F&B Director for Shelter Hall and Sessions. So um, any locals here will know um, Shelter Hall because it's a familiar site. It's a food hall. But the overarching company is Sessions, which is um, a kind of bigger, a bigger national business that actually creates opportunities for um, up and coming brands um, to scale and grow through a network of um, kind of host sites. So it also actually works with SMEs to really grow out the revenue for restaurant growth. Um, we do that through a platform that we've created and we facilitate it through licensing and franchising. So it's actually like a soft touch franchising model. The food hall sits as an incubator, so it's a central figure to actually customize the products, but also to gain that consumer data that we can build out the, the company wide. But we don't we don't really promote it to the consumer as that model because in itself it's much more of a you know a visiting operation site with seven kitchens, two bars, and a, a constant rotating. Um, culinary option with kitchens that we rotate every six to 12 months, unlike other food halls, which more have fixed kitchens. The idea is that we move around alongside the kind of event and content. We actually move the um, the food offering to, to facilitate, you know, much more variety. Um, my background is in, um, I mean, I've done pretty much most of my kind of food-based career in, in London and Brighton. And my background was in much more fine dining restaurants with some of the key leaders in the city, Salt Room, Cold Shed Group, um, Mark's works as well now, um, and like kind of Terra Terre, some of the kind of diehard winners of the city where we worked on creating their position and early days of marketing, especially when it came to social media, working with showcasing them. Um, and then I branched out into consultancy and worked a lot with the council actually, and with the BID, Business Improvement District, um, and with like kind of smaller groups about looking at kind of food tourism and kind of how to actually establish it in the city and then branching up to London, which is how I find myself in my current position. Mark. Hello. Um, so I, uh, I live in Brighton, so don't be fooled by the accent and all that stuff. I do need to leave early because Scotland's playing France tonight and I really want to see it. Uh, so I catch the second half. Um, so uh, in terms of hospitality and all that, I kind of fell into it, which is a common phrase that people talk about with hospitality. So I started off music magazines, lastminute.com, uh, Bartley Card, Yo Sushi and Pret. So finishing up being marketing director at Pret. I left there in 2013. And then I started out being just a freelancer, sort of CMO, gun for hire. So my job now is in three parts. So one is to be a bit of a Yoda style character um, for clients where I get to scratch my beard and say left a bit, right a bit and not do any actual work. Um, so that's cool. So I've got at the moment uh, Burnt Orange. I helped uh, create that. Um, salt Room, uh, Tuto, um, Coal Shed. And then get wee client up in Scotland that's got 20. Uh, venues, so that's uh, they're doing. They're on the road to forty million pounds a year, and we're hoping to get to hundred um, over the next three or four. Um, and then also uh, the other parts of my job get more clients, but the other parts of my job are podcaster. So lucky enough to have sponsors that pay me for it now, which is nice. Um, so basically interviewing the great and the good of hospitality, but sometimes there's a tenuous link, so you can get superstars like Fatboy Slim to come on. Um, and then the last part is I created something during COVID called Hospitality Rising, um, which was basically to try and get a quarter of a million applications uh, into hospitality because we were so short of people. So the whole premise was how can we attract the next generation of talent through using tech and advertising and all that to come in. So think Army be the best, but for hospitality. And I'm sure I'll, I'll talk about that in a wee bit. Absolutely. That's better. So, in this room, I think we have a really interesting mix of people. We'll have some operators who are running restaurants, we'll have some tech people, we'll have data people, and we'll have marketers. So, I think it's a really nice kind of mix of different perspectives on this sector. Um, so, the scene for anyone not in the hospitality world, that there was a big shakeup that happened a few years ago. We won't dwell on it, but it highlighted a lot of technical um, areas of, to innovate and to expand. But in amongst that, 
it became clear that there may be some challenges um, in amongst that. And there's a great phrase that I'm not going to nick around describing what that sort of looks and feels like. Um, but Joe, why don't you take us through um, some of the reports that you guys have done on the kind of space at the moment? Yeah, so as I say, we only work in hospitality and we've got several different tech clients, whether it's EPOS, guest experience, order and pay, bit of everything, which is which is really exciting. We've worked with with, with lots of people. Um, last week in London at Excel was the Hospitality Tech Expo, and I was on two speaking opportunities there with um, my clients Tavalis and Vita Mojo. So with Vita Mojo, I'm going to talk a bit about the research we did for them because it's in the public domain and actually it's a big research report. Kitty is going to send around the link to it after tonight just so you can see the sort of thing that, that came out from there. But I'm going to summarise it a bit now. So this is where I'm going to reach for my iPad because it's got lots of numbers on it. So Vita Mojo are an EPOS company, but they also integrate with other tech partners within hospitality. So guest experience, employee engagement, order and pay, all of that sort of thing because... A lot of the tech companies can't do everything. That's that's the whole thing. They can't be the one size fits all. They'd love to be, I'm sure. But even the big guys like Zonal, um, I don't know if any of you are aware of Zonal, they're probably the biggest hospitality EPOS company there is. They don't do everything. Yes, they bought a, a great CRM platform in Airship and Toggle, the vouchering system, but they can't do everything. So they integrate with experienced partners, with order and pay partners. They do a bit of order and pay. Their system isn't great. We had Zonal in Big Table Group, so I do know it. Um, they have, they do have bookings, but all of those sort of things need to mesh together. So what Katie referred to about how I described tech <laughs> last week at the show was um, having been an operator and had to deal with all these different platforms, not talking to each other or sort of talking to each other, but getting into arguments. It's like a giant ball of spaghetti. You want to find the end, but you can't. You wrap it around your fork to try and eat it, and you can't because it's all raveled up. And that's how I see tech in hospitality. I think it's got better, um, you know, from experience. As I say, you know, eight, nine years ago, I went into an operator business, and it's definitely improved. Is it where it should be? No. Um, for me, I think the tech companies, and I bear in mind I came out of a tech company 12 months ago, do they listen to enough to what the operators want? No. They listen to what they think they 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 want to do with their product, and you know, Yumpingo is a great you know a great example of that. They thought the 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 product people go off and go, oh, we want to develop this this and this. They didn't sense check it with the operator first. Does the operator want it? Is it relevant? Mm. They don't check. They don't check that sort of thing. And I think a lot of the tech companies are really guilty of that. They they think they know what their product should be but they don't listen to the operators as to what the product should be. And I think, Olivia, you'll probably cover a lot of that in your, in your bit in a minute. So with Vita Mojo, big EPOS company, as I say, uh, they were a big key sponsor of, the, uh, of Excel last week. We did a project for them um, very much at macro level to understand we spoke to operators um, in various different um, types of businesses, so casual dining, QSR, coffee shop, bit of pub, little bit of hotel so you know reasonably good spread all with at least six sites some with some of the bigger guys with 100 plus sites so a really good spread of size of operators as well what we did also talk about with them was actually this is all about how it affects the consumer ultimately they want sales right they want their tech to be able to generate sales for for them as operators but actually, you've got to think back to the employees as well. And we, we do a lot of work around employee engagement as well. And we know Hospitality Rising being, you know, a fantastic example. I've been involved with, with Hospitality Rising in, in, a, in a small way as well. We know that recruitment in hospitality is a real challenge. Um, it's always been a challenge, but particularly since COVID, it's been actually not just recruitment, but retention as well has been a real challenge. And actually, tech needs to work for the operator on the front line i.e not the head office but the gm the front of house server the back of house in the kitchen who are using kitchen management platforms hopefully or stock inventory systems so we spoke to a uh, separate from the vita mojo research earlier this year we spoke to 350 um, hospitality frontline employees so those who work in restaurants coffee shops etc and they said that the worst things about working in hospi hospitality were increased pressure due to staff shortages. I think you know that again comes back to what Hospitality Rising are trying to achieve. We know it's been a challenge. We know we probably have all been out and seen 
restaurants, pubs, bars, where actually there hasn't been enough people on the floor or actually the business can't afford to put enough people on the floor. So 37% of people said staff shortages were a problem to them as operators. And 32% said it was deteriorating customer behavior, probably driven by staff shortages, driven by menu shortages, driven by tech not working, driven by the amount of time it takes to get a card machine to your table to pay. All of those sort of things actually fundamentally go towards what tech needs to do for your business and how tech should work for your business as well. So we looked at this project very much along the lines of how can we take the pressure off employees and how can we improve the customer experience, the guest experience? So that's what Vita Mojo wanted to try and understand by us talking to operators. So we talked to lots of operators at reasonably senior level, director level, so MDs, heads of IT, marketing, ops, all of those sort of things. So we've made sure it was across a various level of various types of business. As I say, all had at least six sites. The four main things that, uh, sorry, the three main things that came out of the report, which Kitty will send around or mm -hmm. the link to afterwards for you to download. One was the disconnect between efficiency and growth. So what do we mean by that? It's custom, obviously businesses, operator businesses want to make profit. 64 of them said, 64% of them said that profitability was their key driver to having their business being, doing what they do. They wanted to be profitable, probably fairly obvious. 54% said they wanted to grow customer numbers. They wanted more customers, new customers, repeat customers. They wanted to convert the lapsed customers to come back. They wanted people who had never visited them to come and visit. Driving efficiency was only at 28%. And that's quite interesting because actually tech can be used to drive efficiency. And I'm sure we'll talk a bit about that uh, a bit later. What's interesting is that actually here we're seeing operators want to drive the top line of the business. But actually what they want to do is get more people in the door but they don't want to focus on efficiency which to me seems a little bit backward but I guess you know we've been through COVID numbers are important finances are important we know how tough it's been for operators out there we know on the back of COVID operators are diversified we talked we were talking chatting about delivery earlier and you know delivery became a really really bigger, bigger thing in COVID than it ever had been. There were businesses that had never done delivery before that suddenly needed to do delivery or click and collect. Order and pay became really big because actually businesses had to put it in to be able to cope with the demands of the COVID restrictions, which I won't go into. I had restaurants in England, Scotland and Wales and trying to keep up with the different rules because all three governments wanted different things. Jesus Christ, mm. honestly, that's, that's <laughs> like 12 yeah. months of my life. I'll never get back trying to understand all the different rules. So it really added a lot of new channels, a lot of new tech operators, uh, tech suppliers came onto the scene during COVID um, or started to elevate what they were doing because they felt they needed to. And what that we, that what we saw that led to was more complex tech stacks, more inefficiency. Mm. That big spaghetti ball got mm. bigger and bigger and bigger, mm. um, which was which was a real challenge. And it meant that growth became really tech led rather than customer led. And actually isn't what's important in your business the customer at the end of the day because if yeah. you're not making the customer happy you're not going to get them back or it's going to be a challenge to get them back so on that note there just kind of taking it from the tech to the customer which is a key kind of differentiator in in this universe um it's just kind of feels like maybe a nice point for olivia maybe you could talk about what you guys did um at sessions around bringing that back to the customer and then maybe you come back to some of the other points in that. Um, I mean, it's quite funny enough, I was doing a talk with um, Tech on Toast about a year ago, and during the conversation, the kind of frustration came out and the advice to give to everybody, I, I just said, everybody needs to grow up. And it was because <laughs> it's more about that there is this frustration that the tech industry that, that works with the restaurants was telling them what to do, and the restaurants weren't owning their territory and telling the tech what to do. So there was no integration, there was no, like there was no clarity on where the route the route was going and nobody knew and i think with covid i said it so with covid <laughs> what what it did do it put us all in like a really vulnerable position um and ironically for us with sessions it actually put us in a great position because it gave us no choices so we started in covid we launched um during covid and we launched a food hall during a period that we was very unknown 
we didn't know how people were going to respond. But to be quite honest, that's a wonderful time because you've got one massive apology around you. Mm. So you can do what you want and get away with it. But also it meant that we were hugely dependent on tech. Now, ironically, my CEO, ex-MD of Deliveroo, massive history in tech startup. So, you know, he had gone into food halls with a kind of overriding plan to bring tech into the, the environment of hospitality in a different way to delivery. So he um, so, so when we launched, just to give you an example of the consumer engagement, when we launched, we, we, we struggled to get, um, you know, online ordering that could facilitate multi, multi-site venue, like with yeah. loads of different kitchens. So we had to get one to actually make it for us because nobody in the world had done it. Um, so we got a, a tech company to fast track that. But, you know, it wasn't perfect, but that's fine in that day and age. And then we had to figure out how to use it. And then the terms of COVID were also really restrictive because we had to apply service to it. But then we learned like half service is quite nice. So actually ordering and have been empowered to order through technology, but actually have a human come and bring your food was a lovely midway. So we never lost that because we learned that out of the practice. So I think... I think just on your note there, I mm. think the journeys between the customer and the tech formation are certainly, in my experience, accidental mm. and not specifically aligned. Whereas now we are getting such you know large amounts of data that we can start actually formalizing that in a bit more kind of cohesive way. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if that answered it. Yeah, great. That's great. No, it's exactly that. Exactly that. It's you know, the customer, you know, when, when I was in an operator business, the customer was always king. That was always the thing that you, you hung your hat on. And I don't think the tech suppliers, they, they, they work with the operator, but don't see the end picture sometimes. And not all of them, don't get me wrong. There are some brilliant, brilliant tech operators out there, tech suppliers. And I think they are getting, they are getting better. They've had to get better. You know, we work with, with a lot of them and, you know, that's why they come to us for research because they realize they haven't been doing it as well as they could be. Um, and I think that's important for them to recognise that actually, you know, getting some data from the real front line is really important. So, yeah, so growth was very much tech led and not customer led. Um, what we saw from the re research with Vita Mojo is actually what operators wanted to do was put the menu back at the heart of the tech stack. Because actually it's the menu that drives whether the customer's going to come in or not and the experience and all of that. It's actually not about what the tech does necessarily. It's how that restaurant delivers using the tech they have available to them. And that's the challenge. So the next point. So the first one was dis that I've just spoken about was disconnect between efficiency and growth. The next one was frustration around tech. So 67% of the operators we surveyed were unhappy with their EPOS. That's a big number. That's two thirds of them said, I'm not happy with my EPOS system. The trouble is with EPOS is it's exceptionally expensive to replace. You know, again, going back to my big table group days, we had 250 sites pre-COVID and we did look at taking zonal out. The hardware cost alone was in the millions to replace hardware tills in 250 sites. Mm. So really the EPOS companies, once you're in, you, unless you're a, a very small operator, you're pretty much sewn up with them and you've got to learn to develop with them, which is quite hard going with some of them. So 67% were unhappy with the EPOS. 50%, 50, sorry, I had, I had COVID three weeks ago and I can't shake this bloody cough, so do excuse me. 57% uh, said they have, <laughs> no, no, three weeks ago, I'm fine, honestly. I, I did test before I went to see my dad because he's in a care home. <laughs> exactly. 57% uh, said they had frustrations with their current EPOS system. 44% said they don't have the skills to get the maximum benefit out of their tech. That's quite worrying as well. Yeah. And I think that comes back to how are they training the tech? Have they told the operators at ground level, restaurant level, um, I, I say restaurant, obviously I mean the, the variance on that, is, you know, do they tell them why this tech is important what it can do for them how they should use it probably no no I know <laughs> I know they don't always you know I was responsible for training in an entire new back booking platform and I know bloody well they knew why this platform was important but I don't think the opera the, the suppliers necessarily do a great job in helping to make sure the operator has adequate training and not just training in how to use the app or the system but training in why it's important, how it's important, what benefits it can bring them, and so on. 
So then one in four said they weren't satisfied with the technical support they got from their suppliers. So if something went wrong and they wanted to phone somebody up or phone somebody up, I mean, that's an old fashioned thing, isn't mm. it? But don't you just want to talk to somebody sometimes and for them to talk you through the problem? Um, but they said tech support, 25% said tech support wasn't good enough. Well, maybe if I can slightly go <laughs> off our normal practice, I'm just thinking of ways that, so actually, Jordan, you, when we, when we spoke before, just talk, hearing Joe say, say about there where we have the people on the ground where it's actually a challenge, the technical side is a challenge, and there's not, there's, there's not the knowledge, the understanding, and if there isn't the support from the tech teams, which I think is another reason why it's an interesting group to have here, because there's so much opportunity to improve. But what's your experience listening to Joe's feedback there? Is that something you relate to as a you know the other operator on the panel? Yeah, I mean, looking back, a lot of stress. <laughs> to be honest, when the C word happened for us, um, we didn't have a way of getting beer to people via our website. It wasn't there and four days later we had something, but the, the, the thing we had in between uh, was uh, an American software that was making us produce food and deliver it in one hour slots and we couldn't physically do it. We were all out in vehicles ourselves. We didn't couldn't employ new people. Mm. Um, so it was a, a really awkward time, but as things have evolved, um, our tap room is, is the busiest it's ever been. Um, and then questioning, do we continue having seated service where we come to you? So had the iPad on the strap over the shoulder and coming to people, which we thought, well, this is a lovely way to engage that you can sit down and someone comes and speaks to you. Um, but with the small space that we've got, we've found, and when things got lifted a bit more, is actually people do enjoy standing and queuing at a bar okay, yeah. and engaging that way as well. Um, so we sort of asked people, what do you prefer? You know, you know, do you prefer us to come to you? No, we, we want to queue at a bar. And that's another and one of Joe's normal. points there around experience and menu at the front of it. So with tech, it so crosses over between these two worlds. Um, so, yeah, that, that taps into that as well. Mm. And what's your kind of reality of your tech stack at the moment in within the business? Um, so we use uh, light speed. Um, great yeah? yeah, great. Then we're done. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, we use like speed. We're using. Not one of my clients, but I do know. We we yeah we need to do more in programming with the stock in, in the back end of it. We need to do more of that. Um, mm -hmm. But at the moment, that seems to be a pretty seamless system. Um, but my business partners uh, are directors of Fatu Amano, mm -hmm. so they have a huge business and many sites where I can test things out of them and then get a good deal on what we've got and come under their umbrella, fortunately. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, nice. Yeah. It's yeah. who you know. <laughs> Sorry, Joe, carry no, on. All right. Just going back to your point about the customer experience and queuing at the bar, we've just literally just finished yesterday some research with one of the big order and pay companies. I won't mention them by name, but we did some consumer research. So we went out to consumers and said, do you like using an app to or a QR code to order? And it was really interesting that the research has actually come back. At, it's very mixed and not and surprisingly really mixed amongst age groups. Even the older generation are happy to use it. Their fear of using it is I don't know how long it's going to take me for my drinks or food to be delivered. Whereas if I'm queuing, I can see how long the queue is. and I know how long it's going to take me to get to the front of the queue or I know how long the server is going to take to get to me because I can see how busy it is. And that was one of the big fear things. But actually right through from Generation Z to the, what we call the golden years, the 65 pluses, they're actually quite happy to use tech if it works and if they can understand the benefits of using it, which is things like um, splitting the bill if you're in a group, things like that are actually a massive a massive benefit. Yeah. So that's interesting to hear that, the, you know, people do want to queue still. It's like we're British, you know, or, <laughs> you know, we just like queuing, don't we? It's like... <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those it's one of those inherent things we do. But I think tech's interesting from that point of view. Has actually how can the the order and pay companies were obviously exceptionally prevalent during COVID, and a lot of them have fallen by the wayside or seen their business drop off. I know several operator businesses have gone. Do you know what? We just don't want to use it anymore because we want that personal service back. We want the server to go to the table with the iPad or with you know, a pen and piece of paper and take the order and get that personality behind it. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what this space does. But this research, literally, I saw, I saw the data raw yesterday. So it's very timely. George, just sorry. I was yeah, just going sorry. to say, just on that point, because 
with my day job really is, is marketing stuff. Um, and working with the clients, one of the biggest piece of research I thought was really interesting was seeing what you're saying, which is it was from Deloitte and it said 62% of people want to use tech. Now, yeah. the biggest problem we have in hospitality is it's mainly run by 60 year old white Men. guys <laughs> and and they do what they want and it's like i want this and i don't want uh the human experience to go i could care less what you want and i could care less what your 14 year old kids want and all the rest of it it's about that customer yeah. and what the biggest lesson in marketing i've ever learned over the years is you have to turn the telescope the other way and always put yourself in the customer's shoes and all the chat about tech as well I don't even see it as tech. And what mm. people need to do is map out the customer journey, pleasure points, pain points, the whole thing, and just think, what is the best thing I can do to either enhance that pleasure point or fix that pain point? It might be tech. It might be down in your hands and knees scrubbing something. It doesn't matter. So I think we get caught up in it. But the, the trouble we've got now is the, lead, the captains of industry now are of an age where I don't do Facebook doesn't matter that's a straw pool of one and the most dangerous thing you can do in a business is say i think yeah you absolutely have to look the other way so you know, no just i agree and, you know clearly i'm going to say that data should be at the heart of every decision you make <laughs> i think you're preaching to the choir yeah, here to yeah, be honest preach, yeah. there's a lot of data lovers in the audience we love, oh, we love, we love just, numbers. just to say on that though it's not all about numbers no it's three things right it's qualitative so yeah you know, the call stuff, actually talking to people, seeing what they're saying, because there's nuance mm. in what they're doing. The quantitative, so quantity, so numbers, numbers, but also ethnography. So there's a great phrase in marketing, which is, if you want to see animals, don't go to the zoo, go to their natural habitat. So I'm working with an electric vehicle company at the moment, uh, and also uh, micro banking in, in West Africa. And I'm saying to them, look, have you actually lived with these people? And I mean, take a spare room or lying on their couch, whatever it is, and live with them for a week. What are they into? How do they live? How do they consume media? You know, how do they live their life? And it's, again, the problem with the tech companies, which is super smart people, super privileged. They've all done their Harvard thing and all the rest of it, but they don't know real life. And then it's the race to build a SaaS product with an exit plan, which means they can buy a yacht, yeah. and they don't <laughs> even think about the consumer that they're going for and the trouble with most hospitality tech companies and absolutely not Vita Mojo because they sponsor my podcast um, <laughs> is, and, and, and they were uh, restaurateurs as well you know sort of restaurateurs yeah. um, but it's all about them what, what's the biggest thing I can do to scale to get that exit and it's I think we should do this and do you know it's actually so similar to a couple of clients I've got at the moment the chef doing what they want yeah and not actually what the customers want to eat very different um so yeah and so. i think that you know the tech companies we work with like i say the vita mojo we spoke to operators for them but this order and pay company we've spoken to consumers we've gone out to a nationally representative panel of consumers to understand what they want from tech so it's actually a bit of it is a bit of both it's like and i, I get frustrated with tech companies saying do you talk to people and the same with operators operators do you talk to your customers yes you might get feedback on google and TripAdvisor and all of that but do you actually go out and talk to them but they don't talk to their customers because they're scared about what they'll hear they are they are that, <laughs> i've got yeah. to change what yeah, yeah. you don't, you don't like want that italian oh, okay. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> okay so the the uh, the other thing around frustrations around tech was actually out of the box solutions don't always work i mean they work as in physically work but they don't work for the operator and i think operators are guilty guilty to a certain extent and the tech companies are guilty to selling it that selling an out-of-the-box product and actually what what they want is that that whole thing I mentioned at the beginning, the evolution of operators talking to tech companies to say, we want this from your product rather than the product team going, we're going to develop this, this and this and the operators will love it. But have they actually spoken to the operators about what they love? And very often, uh -uh. Mm. you know, we were guilty of it in Yumpingo when I worked there. So I can, I can completely get that one. The final one was around data-driven decision-making. So back to data. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> but, you know, we see hospitality. It's, um, it's a long way behind retail in the whole loyalty space and, and, um, and all of that. If you think about Tesco Club Card, how long? I mean, I, can't, I dread to think how long I've had a Tesco Club Card and a Boots Advantage Card. But if you think about how long they've been around, it's been 
years and years and years. Their retail is so far ahead of hospitality in terms of loyalty. I think there's a lot of hospitality companies that are starting to do loyalty better. I can see some slight wincing here from <laughs> Olivia. Sorry, I'm that I'd love wince. no, I'd love to hear what you think on that. So I'm not a massive supporter of the loyalty card concept. And I actually think the retailers are pulling it back. I mean, I don't know what you get from a Tesco card the other day. I had to actually ask somebody. Yeah, she had a meal deal. Well, I just asked somebody, give me your Tesco card and I'll put it through and then I'll give it back to you. And I get slightly cheaper and I don't know what you get, but he was happy. <laughs> so I, I just, I feel like that loyalty thing is not through points. It's through engagement, it's through communications, it's through marketing, it's through loyalty. For me, the future of loyalty is... Is a, is a different format. It's it's a higher level of social media engagement, I think. That's what I would say. Mm. I think my next point was going to be, it's, it's not just about the, the points thing. I mean, I gave Tesco Club Card an example because it's been around for so, you know, for so long. It's sort of what we've become used to. But actually, loyalty is about getting that repeat business. It's about using data to drive your business. It's about collecting data, managing data. Um, making sure that you're capturing the data in the best possible way so that you know that when Sarah Jones comes into your restaurant, she's highly likely to order a steak and a glass of Merlot. It's, yeah. you know, getting down to that nitty gritty level of do you, how well do you know your customer by virtue of the fact that the EPOS has told you what they've eaten previously, who they usually come in with, not literally who they usually come in with. That could be an interesting one if it's a table for two. Um, but, you know, how often they come in, um, usually what time of day. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, God. oh hello. The iPad Siri, livened up Siri there. What's going woke on? up. Siri woke up. <laughs> Male Siri. Siri. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Don't tell them. I think, um, you know, 66% of operators said they were frustrated that they're not making their best use of their data. So they recognise they're not using the, making the best use of their data, which mm. I think is really interesting. I think it, there's a lot of companies that can do a lot better. I think it is getting better mm. and there's products out there which can support in making it better but it's it's a really big area that you know if the data is in silos because the tech stack is so fragmented that makes it a real challenge to deal with and I think you know the operators need to get a full picture they want to know they want it to help their menu engineering like the example of you know Sarah Jones comes in for a steak and a glass of Merlot that's really helpful to know that they've got customers that love to come in for that and it comes back to, I always use the example of the pubs of the old, I'm looking at you, Mark, because, you know, we're of an age, oh. an older, sorry, yeah, me too. Um, but, you know, we used to go into your, your, your pub where the landlord knew everyone local by name and knew exactly what they were going to drink the moment they came in the door. And I think hospitality businesses almost need to do that, but without doing it the old fashioned way. And it's using mm. data to drive that as well but i would say there's nothing old-fashioned about someone recognizing you and knowing what your that's needs good old-fashioned customer yeah, I, service i, I, isn't I don't it? think it ever yeah. goes out of style right when you go in and someone actually remembers you i think that's a lovely mm -hmm. a lovely thing and there's a danny mayor you know danny mayor yeah. the famous restaurateur he's got a book called setting the table and he talks about it when a guest comes in to eat with you they've basically got a blank sign around their neck and it's your job to figure out what they need and want. Mm. And that's how you engage with them. Yeah. But there's a phrase I always talk about, which is buy the data, which is always be collecting data. Mm. Um, and that could be just what someone's dog's name, when's it their birthday? <laughs> what you know, yeah. and it doesn't have to be numbers and spreadsheets. You know, I think there's a whole bunch of data. What football teams that person support, you know, why are they down here? All that stuff. So yeah, I, th I think it can be human mm. as well, for mm. sure. I think it's that full picture, like I say, it's menu engineering, it's lo it's loyalty, oh. whether that not necessarily points, but it's it's making sure they come back because they have a reason to come back, and that could be an offer to drive them back. It could be, you know, anything like that. Or, and you know, having a good CRM goes a long way towards that, and integrating a CRM with the whole tech stack mm. is, you know, that's a whole mind blowing piece of work that we mm. tried to do in Big Table. It was it was starting to work when when I left. I think for me, the summary, you'll be pleased to know, is <laughs> there's many challenges um, that the tech operators face. Um, you know, big strategic ones, clearly, they have to develop their products. They have to hopefully listen to the operators and consumers as to what the product should be. They need to be cleaning up the underlying issues with their product because, let's face it, tech evolves at the rate of knots. Um, and they, But they need to bring simplicity, make it simple. You know, there's so many tech companies out there that do a great job that can do, but I think genuinely they can all do better and and work 
collaboratively. You know, they all integrate with each other. You know, Beta Mojo has lots of integration partners because they don't do, for example, guest experience. They partner with someone to do that. That whole integration piece is really important, but it needs to be for the benefit of the operator and ultimately the consumer and not just for the benefit of the tech yeah. company. I can shut up there, sorry. No, I'm it's so brilliant. sorry, I've talked a lot because I love it. It punctuates data. the the exact sort of scene that we need to set around the reality of of the of the way things are, and I think brings us very nicely into like what's the impact currently, and then we'll obviously look to the future. Um, but I think Olivia, it'd be interesting to hear your um, thoughts at the moment on the impact of that because you've um, acquired a uh, mobile POS system, um, correct sort of yeah. phrasing. Um, and so I find that really, really interesting. Obviously, Shelter Hall's very led by the app ordering and you've made some decisions there to kind of take things under your own um, in your own hands. And how's that been? And what's your kind of, yeah, what the, the impact of all of this Days that we can feel through souls. Okay, I think it kind of has to really start with a bit of a journey. So we launched Shelter Hall three years ago, and just about three years ago, um, and you know, to be a food hall, yeah. And you know, the whole idea was it to be a food hall and have good content, all about content, and to give the consumer something of interest, but also find a way to engage in the consumer. How do you follow the consumer? How do you how do you know more about them? And we therefore had ordering app, which we had formed um, with a, an open API system on our till system. Um, we created that and then kind of pushed it to a certain limits. But at the same time, we were branching out in our business and we were going into a bigger area, which was actually looking at the brands that we're working with and the food concepts and licensing them to go into sites nationally. So we started doing that. There were a lot of hit and fails and you know mess ups and learnings I don't know I don't know what you call them but it was it was a time of apology anyway so we we got away with things but there was a lot a lot learned through that process but we now have uh, 25 brands that we work with and we work with 250 sites nationally um and some of those sites have up to three brands within them um and you know I think it, I can I could give you some figures but we've suddenly opened a kind of gateway to something that's really accessible, which is scale and growth for food concepts. Um, an opportunity for somebody to grow their brand without having to pile a load of money into their own kind of CapEx projects or operate loads of sites. Because also one of the things I've noticed throughout my, my period in, in, in the sector is people can create great concepts, they can be great chefs, but they can also be incredibly bad operators. Mm -hmm. um, and often you don't get that beautiful mix. So I always think like, you know, you might be really creative and really good at coming up with a concept, but then find someone to do it. So what we looked at is going, how do you divide that up? And food halls are a great environment for that, where we go, here's a kitchen, you cook, we'll do all the rest. And people love it for that reason. So the food hall then extended out into this um, other side of our business. Um, and we now have a mini franchising model alongside it. But to do that, you need a massive infrastructure um, to actually facilitate the training, the sales, the supply chain, and also the, the finance side of it, the collective data. You know, with a CEO who'd come from delivery, and Dan, when he joined delivery, he was number five in the business. So he grew it quite uh, early days. And I think his biggest take from working on a business like that, and we all have our opinions about different delivery companies and delivery in general, but his take from working with delivery was data. And he looked at the restaurant industry and he said, why the hell don't you have any data? Like, what are you doing that doesn't give you data? And because we weren't, none of us were collecting data on a great level. And he came from the theory that you, you can't make a decision without data. You don't know what you're referring to. You don't know what your next step is. So our learnings were that any business in hospitality needs to have similar data to the delivery industry, other tech startup industry, or anything that actually grows from what they have. So what we've done is we've created an infrastructure to develop this large franchise licensing model, but we started plugging in all the elements that we need. So a lot of things we do manually at the moment, we might do them efficiently, we might do them inefficiently, training, supply chain management, ordering systems. But what we're doing now is we're 
creating a platform, or as we call it, the box. Um, basically a platform to connect all of those together to make all that element much more autom automated. So we purchased a POS company in the summer, probably had the similar story to what you were saying about lots of tech companies who set up, um, they were POS companies, they then focused a lot of their attention on um, creating online ordering and therefore probably put a lot of money into it and then they find themselves kind of crippled in a market that doesn't need them in the same capacity. We love online ordering, we like to rip it apart, we like to plug it into things, we like to mess it up. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we can acquire people who are really good at that into our business and actually work with them directly, then that's heaven for us. So we purchased this POS company and it's given us a really good structure to redefine our business alongside the model that we're doing. Um, there are similar businesses to us that do something much more focused around delivery. So like kind of Reef and Peckwater and I don't know if you Taster, lots of these different companies out there. And some of them have been struggling and struggling because their market is very small. So for us, what we're looking at is, is, is how you adapt and grow. It's about innovation in it and looking at, you know, how you step into an environment and then, but you always need to look at what you're offering and offering content, offering a brand to somebody is lovely, a brand that they can actually plug into their kitchen and they can make it work really well instantly. Offering a support structure that can market that brand is even better. But if you offer a support structure that actually tells them when to order, tells them what their accountability is, gives them the data on a weekly basis, manages their finances, and actually just does all that kind of headache work, then you've got a perfect kind of environment. So that's what we're looking at. That's the ideal. Mm. And it's stepping stones towards that. For, for me, I think we have huge fear at the moment in the business around, well, we don't actually in hospitality, but in general, we've got huge fear about AI taking over people's jobs. And AI is not going to take over people's jobs, but it can get rid of the really dull work mm -hmm. that's in between. The jobs that we don't do brilliantly, the things that we make errors at repeatedly. So I think for me, looking towards um, the area that, we as a company are developing and the area I think hospitality needs to go in is, is, is that automation that comes through mm. tech packages. And as Mark said, it's not tech, it's just, it's just your infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Well, on that, Mark, what's, what's your sort of take? So in terms of the impact of, you know, the setting, the scene setting that we've heard from Joe, you work across several different brands. Yeah. Um, how are things being implemented at the moment and what's, you know, what's gone well, what's, how are things going and how important is that data piece and what's happening in AI if we can avoid going down the rabbit hole too deep, which yeah. does tend to happen on that chat. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think going back to the original stuff on tech, a lot of the clients that I work with, they're so small overworked, understaffed, underfunded. This is like number 10, number 11, number 12 on the list of things, which is keep this business open, keep us having staff. What can we do about our energy bills? What about that, you know? So for probably the majority of hospitality businesses, tech isn't in the top five things that they're worrying about right now because mm. they're wondering every week if they're going to be alive, you know? So if we flip it slightly to the ones that are, I, I think the biggest mistakes are, and you touched on it earlier, we're talking about how tech companies are bad, operators are bad. So the whole issue here is that operators sometimes, often, they'll take on a tech company, but as a tick box exercise, and they'll go, great, we've got that like speed EPOS, great, we've got that CRM system, great, We've got whatever, but it's kind of like getting the, you know, the web page or the, the pamphlet to get a six pack. You have to work on it yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is operators buy the stuff, shiny, shiny, dopamine hit, all the stuff. And then they think, great, I've done that, done. And they don't actually ask or do the homework or watch YouTube videos are very handy. You know, how to actually make these things work individually. Now, the second point is, how do they all, so when you get all the kits, so let's say they've bought CRM, customer service, you know, phone call software, they've got EPOS, they've got um, 
what else would they have? Loyalty scheme, you know, all these things. First thing is they just put them all up and they're in silos and they're across different teams and different people that maybe even don't talk to each other, like physically, right? So, right? No chance. Don't hate ops. Um, so, so basically, that, that's all in silo. So then the next point is you've then got to optimize each of these things. So if you've got seven rooms, seven rooms, uh, the the booking system. If you if you don't know, it's probably one of the best out there. So in terms of that, you've then got to get someone in to optimize that, and it's customer journeys and when are you going to have it on staff training, all that. So that's work. So basically, people sort of have a baby and then they expect it to bring itself up and get to university and be a world leader and it's not happening so mm -hmm. you want so you need to buy the kit and if you there's a buy cheap buy twice problem right as well so try your best to buy the best thing you possibly can in each of the areas and anyone in hospitality is so helpful and they'll give you advice and they'll tell you who to avoid and who to go for so then get them the players on the field. Then you've got to opt, get them all fit. So you've then got to optimise all that. And then the third thing is, how do they interact with each other? So sort of I've got the Scotland game on my mind. So if you think about football, <laughs> how does that team play together? So you can have a whole bunch of superstars, but they don't actually work that well. Manchester United. So in terms of that, you know, you've got to get them all, you know, and that's a project I'm working on with one of my clients up in Scotland. Now, the thing that's missing from all these tech things is that often middleware to actually talk to each of them. And then actually you've got to have a marketing department that understands what information, I mean, there's ops and all that, but from my selfish point of view, you want a marketing team that then is thinking, well, what am I asking of these systems? And then what's going to give me the best insight, the most frictionless thing? And in hospitality marketing, it's really easy. Get more new customers, get them to come more often, and get them to spend more when they do. It's pretty simple. So that's what you're wanting out of that. Um, so that that's that ecosystem. And then just um, in terms of AI and marketing, obviously it's a buzzword and everyone thinks they're a prompt engineer now and all that stuff. But basically, in terms of that, um, it's really exciting. I think it's so exciting for, for, for marketers because A, talking about all this stuff we don't want to do, you're going to be able to A, B, C, D, E, F, test the life out of it to see what works. Is it that colour? Is it that phrasing? Is it whether it's, you know, social media posting or, I mean, think of all the things it's going to be able to write for you and then you've got the mid-journey stuff that's going to create things. And then what one for BlackRock, so for burnt orange and tuto and all these they we've just taken on a new creative agency who are not from brighton i'm really sorry um well they don't want they, 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 they phoned it in the other two so what do you want me to do i get the best people right i don't care where they're from so um so basically in terms of that they've, they've done a great job but the presentation they gave us back so tuto were on a turnaround project for that at the moment the italian in brighton and uh, didn't have a great start in life so we're working on it but they come back with ai uh, images about what the frontage could look like and the interiors and the food and it was like holy crap this is brilliant and it won them the pitch because they really went for it and then actually we were about to spend send out our christmas brochures for the coal shed and i saw the pictures and i said that food's burnt you can't even put that one so they used ai to unburn the food it wasn't it wasn't burnt it was just like short rib with a barbecue sauce on but it looked you're going i'm not going there it's burnt um so anyway they could fix that so i think there's loads of ways you can do it ai and operations is really exciting as well because what's going to happen and it's happening right now actually i did a podcast on it with, with an ai expert and there's a lot of companies bigger hospitality companies especially food service and things like that where once you've had your food the server brings the plate into the kitchen and puts it under a camera and then the camera starts to judge is your portion sizing too big? Mm. And then with your menuing, you know, so that's going to optimize all your price and everything. With your menus as well, what you'll be able to do is just give it the ingredients and it will come up with funky names and funky pictures and the whole thing. So uh, you know, as I say, I'm I'm really into it. So we again, we're behind in hospitality talking about this. So I've got a holiday client. I was with them the other Friday for the board meeting. And they were talking about doing um, individualized emails as a test to 200,000 of the recent bookers. 
So they took the spreadsheet of the person's name, where, what airport, where they're flying to, yada yada, and they put it into AI, gave it a bunch of uh, descriptions, and AI came back almost instantaneously with 200,000 individualized, personalized email with things to do where that person was going on their holiday. Personalized trip to Dublin, personalized trip to Rome, etc. And then the second part was we're, we're just discussing some action points in the meeting. And the CEO was sitting next to me, Matthew, he's a young, sort of really kind of great go-getter guy. And he asked the marketing team, have you done those uh, marketing campaigns with AI? And he says, yeah, yeah. What consumer behavior psychology did you feed into it? What are you basing it off of? And I'm just sitting going, oh my God. Because I'm thinking that we're doing some good things in hospitality. Ain't seen nothing yet. So hospitality really is the ginger-haired stepchild. I can say that a little bit. I've got a ginger child. Um, but the ginger-haired <laughs> stepchild of all of it. Because we don't have the money. We're always got our hand out. Um, we don't have enough money. We don't make enough margins to actually do what Amazon's doing and, you know, and all the rest of it. So mm. it's tough. It's tough. But we'll try our best. I have a story on that one, actually. Go just on, to, Olivia. Just to, um, I think it's also we don't have the time. And actually, sometimes if you just don't put that absolute concentration in. So one of the things that we did do is we opened a site in London to kind of replicate the food hall concepts and uh, our, the food hall style. And we had four like really great brands in it. But we went over the top because what we did is we put KDS systems in. We put cameras that would interpret if the portion control. We did all of that. But we didn't do it with knowing everything. Yeah, we bought the yeah. so we, we got everything designed. Was all the, all the gear on the way? Yeah, it, yeah <laughs> it was, and it was kind of like, it was like, I remember thinking like, the, it was like we all just stripped naked yeah. for a couple of days around launch. Did yeah, we didn't oh, do that, but it felt like that <laughs> because it, it really exposes you when you do things like that, when you think, oh, we've gone too far. We've tried to like, we've tried to ask too many questions in one moment. And I think that's the thing is, is actually thinking, you know, what am I asking? What do I want to know? And what do I need to do that? And then, right, that's done. Then the next, then the next. Um, and, you know, I think we could all be very ambitious and follow some of the, you know, some of the some of the innovative work that other business, other um, areas are, are on. But I think we have to be conscious of the kind of cumbersome nature of hospitality. Yeah. And therefore, sometimes we can't do that. You mm. know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Jordan, I'm really interested in your take on all of this, coming from a slightly different perspective, I think, after our chats. And what I love about talking to you, and when we mention, we think about loyalty that's brought, been brought up, we talk about experience, we talk about cues, we talk about the real life of this in amongst this tech world. Mm -hmm. um, for you guys, I know that, you know, creative is a huge, huge driver to, I imagine you can tell me, but like building up those things. We've got a couple of slides and, and we'll we'll get to those. But um, yeah, I mean, wh where's your head at when, when you hear all of this conversation happening and you're like, hey, look, go like gorgeous artwork on cans and, and where, where's your head at with it all? So yeah, the, the, the loyalty thing, something I definitely want to pick up on as well, because that, that's one thing we've argued over a lot for, for a long time on on what it actually is. Um, we have a points system with buying beers online. You buy X amount of beers, you get X amount of points, and then you can get rewards. And if it's your birthday, maybe we'll send something to you. So it's very minimal. Um, but you were saying there's other ways to rewards that isn't points, or we think about taking it away from website as well. But you're saying with marketing, so how would you individualize a reward to someone personally if they've spent? A lot with you or if they're a, a top customer points in terms of a website does that but you were saying there's other ways i was interested to know what you were thinking yeah, i mean i don't necessarily <coughs> sorry <laughs> i don't necessarily have a solution it was more the kind of challenge for it really um yeah. and i think sometimes i think the difficulty is that points need to be growing points don't they because like you kind of when you get something back then you want more back and you want more back we can't afford to do that so it's like how do you do a parallel of that like is it like engagement is it opportunity is it exclusive offers is it exclusive experiences you know is there something in ai that you can do you know there's something that you can probably go a bit further with 
yeah. where it's not about loyalty, it's about personalization. Mm -hmm. So it's different. So it's like, do I as a customer want to be given something because I've done something over and over again? Probably not. I probably want maybe someone to tell me I've been making good choices and then give me a better choice. So it's how do you do that, really? Just mm. yeah. So uh, sometimes it's a bit of an audience splitter, but uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, you guys know yeah. Gary Vaynerchuk? So Gary V um, wrote a brilliant book years ago called The Thank You Economy, and he ran his father's wine store. Um, so he grew it from a couple of million pounds a year, did a YouTube channel every day, uh, this thing called Wine Library, Wine Tasting. Went up to 60 million and that's how he got his money and he was lucky enough to put it in all the unicorns in, in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, but he's got a great book called The Thank You Economy. And there, and this is just as simple as this, surprise and delight. So you just look at your top 20 customer, 20% 20 customers and you just send them stuff, right? Yeah. And it might not be unbarred beers as much as that would be amazing. It might be that you stock them online a little bit and you go, they love, God, I was going to say Coldplay. They might love Coldplay, I don't know. But they love Bombay Bicycle or Boris. And um, Little Sims, well, I don't know, try to think of a cooler band. Um, but anyway, so <laughs> in terms of that, um, you just get them a signed CD. You send them two tickets to the gig, yeah, whatever. And that will pay That's off so experience. much more yeah. 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 than, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's dead mm -hmm. straightforward. Mm -hmm. Just be kind, do mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. That's brilliant. Well, straight away, I'm thinking we we can actually produce in individualized labels. So yeah, all that. If you had that a beer with or your from, from name, their or, feed, yeah. yeah, take one of those things for Instagram feed, and then don't even you know that's coming. But yeah, yeah you've yeah. got that. Yeah, I'll invoice you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an instant party if you had a case of that. <laughs> so yeah, this is collaborate. So the the idea Which is that actually push. Sorry, the, the right one. So this is around yeah. collaboration, both within tech, hospitality, but also within hospitality, it's a lot of creative innovation and thinking about how we can also innovate in that way and collaborate. And um, so, yeah, Jordan, you've brought a few. Thank you. I, I, these through. these aren't mega slides. It's only a couple of slides, but it's more to keep me on track. Um, as you might find, I've got ADHD and I will go all over the place. Um, but yeah, just a bit of background on what uh, Unbarred is. Um, yeah, started nearly 10 years ago and it's become an absolute passion project of challenging what beer is. Uh, our, one of our strap lines is made of Brighton. It's a culture, it's a, a, a passion aligning with other creative people um that that believe in in doing something differently and from when i started putting mango in a beer was like a ridiculous thing you know don't put that shit in my beer <laughs> um to now it's you know on the supermarkets and uh everyone is still challenging what what beer is which is great but we want to take people on a journey and we want to inspire we want to innovate uh, not just in our industry one of the the beautiful things in brewing uh, and with innovation as well, um, there isn't off-the-shelf information. You've got to go and do it. If you're going to innovate, you're not innovating if you've bought something and you're copying it or you found it. Um, so with brewers, we share information. A lot of us share, um, you know, how, how have you bloody achieved this? I don't even know how you've done it. And quite often we do openly share what those things are so one of the greatest opportunities to do that is collaboration and i know a lot of industries collaboration is like oh why would you work with the enemy you know the the end goal for us is to grow the bigger market of what craft beer is and the biggest market is is macro beer and and other drinks um we all want to work together to grow the craft community uh, and there's plenty of it to go around as, as we feel um, so yeah, there's a couple of coll collaborations locally and just talk through how we came to the conclusion, how we worked together in the process. Um, Bird and Blend, um, I'm sure most of you guys know Bird and Blend uh, and Chrissy. Um, wonderful, wonderful business, wonderful people. They also started very small scale in their flat. I started in a shed, so we had this... Uh, first moments of thinking creatively how we can do this differently i would say bird and blends are sort of the, the craft tea makers 
Um, I haven't seen anyone challenging what T is as, as well as these guys do. Um, and their following is is unbelievable um, with all the T puns you can possibly think of if you follow the mailers. Um, I think calendar at the moment as well. <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, it's, it's uh, definitely worth grabbing that is. Um, <laughs> So we we got together, um, fortunately, and just hit it off straight away. What what could we do? How could we make a beer? Um, and or make a tea? Are we going to make a beer tea? No, that's not going to work. Um, so we used one of their popular uh, teas, which is a, a raspberry blue tea. Um, and we use a base beer, which is called a Berliner Weiss or a sour. So it's got a tart finish, as you would find with tea. Um, does have a tart tang to to um, a lot of teas. So with this, we used uh, also a lot, a lot of uh, raspberries. So in the essence of the beer, it was a raspberry-based beer. And the crossover was where we used the actual tea itself, the green tea, steep that in the beer and then we use these uh blue pea flowers uh these blue pea flowers didn't realize how expensive they are they're more expensive than gold um and we didn't realize how much we needed we did a small scale uh tried to scale it up and we needed huge amounts of it we ended up something like 14 kilos of this these blue pea um they come in a bag like this big and that's only five kilos because they're so light so we're like filling up this massive vessel uh and then poor gary our, our lee blue uh, uh brewer got absolutely covered in it and, and looked like a smurf uh for about a week he couldn't wash this poopy flower off him so um do it with integrity don't cut corners is something we say if you're going to do it get the raw ingredients um work with people and really think about how both your products are going to be interesting to both your markets and share your markets um so we, we did a video and we talked the way through it um that went really far and wide they have an enormous audience uh in their in their field and in our field um i mean we're boated in the 250 best beers in the world um we're at all the big craft beer events now and i'm talking at the uh Brewers Congress tomorrow, so we we've come a long way. Um, so we, awesome. we've got a nice big audience ourselves as well. Um, so yeah, lovely opportunity to work together. And tea drinkers that didn't think they liked beer were saying, "I didn't like beer, but I really like this. This is lovely." So learnt that some beers can be sour. Got into it, and then they've come back down to the tap room, and we've built this lovely relationship with them. And then all of their tea bags went out if anyone ordered this beer would have their tea bags in the boxes and they mm. went all around the country um yeah and another reason for us to collaborate a lot at the beginning is uh reaching a, a wider market geographically so a lot of breweries will have a local market which everyone tends to want to support the local market a local brewery uh and for us you know one issue we've got is We've got customers north of us, the other side of the sea. So we we don't have that as many as if you're in central Leeds or Manchester, you actually have a much bigger local audience. So how do we do that? And we've done collaborations with breweries as, as far as Scotland, uh, Fierce Brewery. Um, don't even know those guys. Uh, we Heavy, yeah, we did a We Heavy um, with with Heather and Honey. Um, so that's that's been a great opportunity for collaboration. So. The other one I wanted to say was uh, True Thoughts. True Thoughts, uh, Brighton record label. Um, Bonobo was on True Thoughts. Uh, they started under a staircase in Brighton. Um, so another humble beginning. Um, but we did this through COVID. We were talking before it happened. And because of uh, supply, could not get any vinyl printed. And this is their annual annual release of like the best of what's on True Thoughts, who, they, who they've signed up. It was like it's the first year and we're not going to be able to release it on vinyl. It's really sad. And like, was, you know, why can't we get it on vinyl? And there was a rumor that Adele uh, and the record label had made Adele records across the whole world, had sort of got first dibs on any vinyl pressing, and no one else, a little label like True Force, weren't going to get, uh, in, you know, anyway, getting in there. So, innovation. Uh, it was the first cam we're aware of. This uh, cam we designed uh, was a peel-off label. Uh, it would stick to one side, but you peel it off. 
So the front of the can was the image that was going to get put on the vinyl. And as you peel back the label, it had all the liner notes inside of all the different artists, as you would on a vinyl if you open it up. Oh, that's nice. um, so it was, it was a lovely touch. And it was a QR code that if you pointed your phone at it, then you would have the playlist play whilst, whilst enjoying that beer. Um, so, yeah, how can you sort of think, think differently and in between the box and, and work mm -hmm. with two brands together? Um, I think this is my last page. I've only got two pages. Um, and we've just done this. So for craft beer community, um, socials have been a bit, uh, not sure how far we're going to dig into this. When um, we first met, we spoke about TikTok. We're, we're now doing pretty well on TikTok. We've got a big, um, big following in Japan um on tiktok and we've got uh they go wild for a honeycomb milkshake and like nice. they just put it upside down straight in a pint and there's all the fingers going around every, every <laughs> could, you, could you do a partnership with the regency restaurant because it's just like busloads of asian people yeah. is it there. Yeah, yeah yeah get a little stand outside you'd make a fortune <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> see what we can do um but we, as an innovative brewery, wants to try and venture more into it. What more can we do with social media? I mean, it's for us, the, the, the bottom line is we can reach a much larger audience, but how do we use these things effectively? Mm. So we did a beer. It's just been released now um, called Like and Subscribe. <laughs> and we have a partner who's a hop supplier, which we got these brand new hops uh hops are the leaves that you put in beer that get bitterness aroma and flavor um they're doing it all with liquids um so you get huge um yields so basically more beer out of your tank you're not losing because you're using this this liquid format um and then we use different collaborators so from um uh, from the guild of beer writers to podcasters to vloggers to TikTok one minute beer review um, so yeah, we had over 73,000 uh, people we connected to in a very short window, mm. um, which we've got, I think about 15,000 on, on our Instagram is one pro uh, platform. So to think by doing that, we've worked with people that are passionate about craft beer, uh, love what we do. And, you know, most of them, it's their hobby and their passion, not, not mm. their full-time jobs and work with all of them to get message out there really quick um and i think there's way more we can do that you know just in the short conversations listening how far text come just in the last few years and how much we're using it yeah um what more could we do i mean we've got a canvas it's a product but there's a canvas there what can we do with that canvas you know can we interact with that more um but the other one is yeah what i was, was really interested with was you know how do we engage more with the customers and reward them because we get a lot of return business which is you know a lovely thing to think you know some weeks we've had up to 70 percent return business which is absolutely incredible um but how how else can we uh, engage and, and reward those people well it's a lovely point to look to the future and then do some Q and A because we're coming a little close to time, but Mark, I'm going to be looking to you to do some future gazing for us. We're gonna we've mentioned TikTok here. Yeah. I know that TikTok has been m on your agenda recently, and I know also you've been thinking about with the big innovation and and drive that you've had with hospitality rising around how you're going to be getting that message out there and refining it. Yeah. Um, so I look to you to gaze at the stars with us. Uh, about recruitment? <laughs> no, about the sort of the future, <sighs> you know, what, where's your head at? I mean, we, we spoke yeah. a little bit about tech before when we met yeah, yeah. Um, recently. Um, and, you know, TikTok's been mentioned there, which I think is really interesting in terms of what do we all keep doing to make sure we're getting noticed? Because we talked about loyalty. Fine, they're through the door. Mm. But we've got to get the message out there. We've still got to market mm. the, the products to new customers. Yeah. Um, be creative in that way um, and so yeah what, what's your sure. where's your head at with the future of of what you're doing um, at the moment where my head's at is a frustration with anyone under 30 that does marketing um, and yeah. thinks that organic social is the answer to everything so tech um, just with tech I, I think the biggest thing is you've just got to see it as a means to an end and it's not everything mm. so i think all you're ever doing is 
two things. One, you're only ever asking the question of yourself, what question am I trying to answer? What problem am I trying to solve? Because again, we can get all fancy pants and throw everything at it and buzzwords and all the rest of it. Um, so I think there's that piece. And then just in terms of actually executing on the tech, it really is that buy cheap, buy twice thing. So in terms of future gazing, I guess I can only speak maybe on the marketing side, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, so what I would love to see is a marketing department split into, I guess, sort of four sections. So you've got acquisition of customers. So that should only be about 25% of your efforts. And then you would put much more effort through tech and personalization and all these things to being about retention. And then in between that, you've got content and you've got analytics. And if you mesh all of those together, you know, you're, you're not going to go far wrong. Um, I, I guess what I'm excited about in the near term, if I'm thinking, looking to the future, is this step up in social media, which is we're all, actually, there's a great um, video, uh, and I can't remember what the name of it is, but I'll send, I'll send the link about it, right? And it was actually made pre-Facebook, and it predicted what's happening right now. And actually, within it, it also predicts that Google and Amazon will get together to create a company called Google's on, and then they <laughs> bin Microsoft out. The New York Times doesn't exist anymore. It's just a letter for posh people that live in New York. It's <laughs> like a pamphlet that comes through, if you're really. But what it talked about was almost this being the remote control for everything and the for life. Um, but also every single one of us would be a broadcaster. So every single one of us had a radio station, which then became podcasts. And it actually then, not to spoil the end, spoiler warning, um, but towards the end, there's, there's this young lady just saying, hi, and she's an American accent. Hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm in wherever she is in America, and I'm doing this today, and everyone's tuning in. So in terms of future for me, it's thinking about you are a media business, really, in terms of doesn't really matter what you do, but you're a media business, and the whole thing is about you being comfortable about being in front of that camera, and it's going to be that 24-7. You know, you're just going to be creating content, and brand guidelines are going to go out the window. Mm -hmm. Brand language is going to go out the window, and it scares me, brings me out in a rash because I'm a brand guy, really. But it's about, A, being relevant on that channel that you're on, and then, B, actually you giving your brand en masse to content creators. And all you're going to do, and we're going to be in a situation where we'll give our brands to, so you want to sell a ton of unbarred, you'll get the best content creators and you don't tell them what to do. You give them almost a slalom pole flags and you say, I just need you to hit these and I need you to end up there. How you get there doesn't matter. So again, I'll put a video in this and it's an example for Hospitality Rising. Um, so just really super quickly on that, but we're just trying to get a quarter of a million people to apply in a year to work in hospitality. We did that as of last week. So we've got three weeks left. So yeah, they're right. Um, and we, we managed to raise uh, gross uh, two million quid from nothing. So a million quid in cash and a million quid in free creative help from Google and Amazon's lead creative agencies, Ogilvy, you know, the best thinkers in the world. Um, and the army be the best team actually did all the insight and we got all that for free. So it was just unbelievable. But on that, TikTok was the number one way to apply for a job and I'll get to future in a sec, um, out of it. So we saw that people under 30 wanted frictionlessness. And that can mean a whole host of things. So really tech needs to aid frictionlessness. So whatever you're doing in life, it should be as easy as ordering a Deliveroo, an Uber, Spotify, whatever. So it should not be more complicated than that ever. So no matter what all you guys do, that's the that's the utopia. So with that, we um, tore up recruitment marketing for a client that I had up in Scotland. So we recruited on TikTok and we had this really crazy um, Scottish TikToker that's got, three, he's called Stephen McKell. He's got 3 million plus followers. And um, he's, you know, just kind of a real larger than life character. And I showed it to my client and he said, there is no effing, he did use the effing mm -hmm. word, way that we are using him or that video. 
So I was quite disappointed because my theory was you go into TikTok, you choose the content creator because you know they're right for their audience that you're trying to reach. You're dad at the disco. They're not. They're relevant. So it was like, great, let's do that. So he said, no way. So anyway, I was in Five Guys with the wee one uh, and I got a phone call and I was like, oh, right. So I picked up the phone and then I, was, I thought really fast and I was like, you like cars, right? He's a real petrol head or EV head now. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he said, um, yeah, I love them. I said, do you think any less of a BMW or a Tesla if they blow it up on Top Gear? No. Do you find it quite engaging and it might even make you think more of that brand? Yeah. Same thing. I was like, just trust me. So anyway, we went for it. 38% of all applications came through his TikTok video. Now, in terms of how we did it, all we did, because people under 30 don't want to fill out a CV. How many people under 30 in here have got a CV and they like filling in application forms for jobs? <laughs> Zip. No. So when you're in hospitality, if it's a frontline person, chefs are reasonably famous for low academia and dyslexia and all these things, which can be a superpower in a lot of ways. Um, and what do I care what school they went to? Don't give a shit. If they want to help someone and they actually want to serve someone and they want to be <clears throat> hospitable, then that's all we need. It's a psychological hire. So anyway, all you had to do was write hashtag I need a job. <clears throat> Excuse me a sec. Um, so all you had to do in the comments was write hashtag I need a job and that's what the video told you to do get your COVID. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just going to go and get tested at the drive through um, so, um, so yeah, hashtag I need a job. Now the HR departments hated us because at that point we had a community team at a TikTok uh, agency called Antler and they basically had the community team and they sent a, li a link to that person and it just went to a very clear landing page. Two things in it, you only need to fill in one. Give us your phone number, give us your email. That was it. And the great thing is, horrible phrase, but you had them with the short and curlies, right? So you've you've got a bit of them, but you don't have loads. So the nature department had to do all the hard work. So they had to actually do some hard work, which was phone people and say, would you like an interview or talk to people? Or, and they hated us. And what happened was they had to work weekends, they had to pull shifts, because I said, it's a 12-hour service level agreement. You cannot, um, can you imagine, well, you've probably seen it, if you write to a company and they leave you hanging for more than two or three hours online, that's dog years, right? So you have to get to someone like that. And a real example was one of the big pub co's, uh, one of the HR directors in there, her son had applied for a job in the company she was one of the heads of HR for, and they didn't contact him for a week. Mm. He then had applied to Deliveroo, Just Eat, and Uber Eats. He took a job with all three of them, he got all the kits, all set up, everything that he needed within two days, and now he plays them off against each other about what's the biggest money job he's going to get. Mm -hmm. That's what we're up against because everyone's now that hustle culture, they're entrepreneurial, they're smart. Amazing. You can, you know, talking about tech, mm. you can make 40 grand a year to 100 grand a year just selling pictures of your feet, right? <laughs> On OnlyFans, right? I've got a size 13, I could probably do all right. So, <clears throat> you know, so in terms of, and a broken toe, maybe if there's a kink going on. Um, so in terms of that, you know, that's what we're fighting against. So we need to embrace technology and, and, and hospitality, but also I think there's a big problem in recruitment. And I think mm. <clears throat> recruiting people through tech has to be frictionless. So at Hospitality Rise in year two, is we're going to build a super app that you can apply for a job in under 30 seconds any way you like. And what's going to happen then is that the HR community are going to have to come and meet us mm. and they're not going to like it. <laughs> but that's the way that we're going to get Gen Zs yeah. and Gen A's coming through now into hospitality because we've been Jurassic for too long and just because it worked in the 60s doesn't mean to say it works now and we're in danger of becoming Kodak, which yeah. I'm really worried about. Well, it's exciting to hear that you've made such a big move in a challenging time and that it's being innovated to i would be never do it again by the way if i knew <laughs> how hard this was going to be yeah. i would never have done it but anyway rush your blood to the head 
So, yeah. Yeah, amazing. So we've gone a little over time, but I think it would be great to see if there's any questions from the audience <laughs> or from online. If not, we'll see if there's any final words from the panel and then possibly go get a drink. Um, yeah, so any questions from the audience before we...